Hello, and welcome to the last presentation of the fall 2017 season of the Medical History Interest Group. I'm Melissa Nasia. This presentation is sponsored by the Law Office Library History Collections and the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance sheet. We've also got uh, refreshments in the, back, in the back, and there is a small exhibit to the side that you're welcome to stay right after the presentation and look at. <coughs> if you were attended as part of the ECU Wellness Passport Program, please see Lane Carpenter right over here uh, now to sign up and then see Lane again after the program for your stamp. We're working on the spring 2018 presentations and they will include dentist Painless Parker, nurse Clara Moss, Civil War Medicine, and the history of PTSD. Today's presentation is Vaccines, Successes and Tribulations. The presenter is John M. Lehman, PhD, Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. Dr. Lehman has been at uh, Brody School of Medicine for 14 years, serving in various positions. They include Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at the BSOM, Associate Vice Chancellor for Research for the Division of Health Sciences, and Acting Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Studies at ECU. He earned a BS from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science in bacteriology in 1964, and a PhD in pathology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1970. He has served a numerous NIH study sections during his research career. The current exhibits, all of whom are on the uh, fourth floor around us, we have a pop-up exhibit on vaccines to complement this presentation. We have the newly installed exhibit, Science, Scientists and Their Microscopes. We have Visions in Wood, Carved Creations by Dr. Leonard Trujillo, Chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy in the College of Allied Health Sciences. And the NLM Traveling Exhibit, Pictures of Nursing, the Zwerdling Postcard Collection. And that is complemented by these two, uh, by several display cases that have um, materials from the Country Doctor Museum. So here is John H. Lehman with Vaccines, Successes, and Tribulations. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> okay, what prompted me to uh, talk about vaccines was I've had a, a real interest, even though I haven't actively worked in vaccinology, I've actually worked in virology, uh, mostly in tumor biology. And approximately uh, February this year, uh, this book came out, The Vaccine Race, by Meredith Wadman. And basically it's a story of a number of vaccines that were de developed in Philadelphia at the Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology, uh, primarily by the virology group there. Uh, vaccines for polio, for uh, German measles, rubella, uh, for rotavirus, and also for rabies. And I also happen to know all of the main players in that. So what I did is I got the book. I actually, actually met the author, uh, uh, Dr. Weidman, uh, at a meeting uh, in 2014, which I'll mention at the end, and had a very lovely discussion regarding this. So I was very impressed, and I'm not selling the book, okay, but it was a, a real interesting uh, rendition of uh, the development of the use of uh, human cells in vaccine production and why. So I'm going to begin by actually talking about uh, science. I decided to look up a definition of science, the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systemic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through <coughs> observation and experimentation. And one thing that I've learned in my life in science is one of the most important things is observing, 
Uh, obviously, if you have the uh, equipment and the laboratory and uh, the ability, uh, the knowledge, you can do experimentation, but observation plays a lot. So if we go uh, to the next slide, uh, if you go to the National Library of Medicine on the internet, uh, it has a list of uh, all the vaccines uh, that were developed at various times throughout the world. And so what I did is I just amended some of this and decided to look at, it all started uh, right here, is work with smallpox. Okay, and actually at the 11th century, 12th century, uh, in China, Indi India, and uh, some of the Middle East, people were using uh, variolation, which was actually taking the smallpox dried scabs and then immunizing children and adults. And they found out by trial and error that they were actually protected against smallpox, which actually is a, a very major problem, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, when we get into, into the talk a little bit more. So that was in the 12th century. And then uh, uh, an Italian, Frescataro, wrote a, a, a book, uh, two books, one of which was uh, the theory, germ theory of disease in his book. And uh, he came up with the term fomites, that there was something that you could catch, either by touching or by aerosol. He didn't know anything about bacteria or viruses or anything. And he also wrote another book, which is also famous. Uh, it's called Syphilis and the French Disease. And it's a story of a shepherd boy who uh, uh, makes an enemy of one of the gods, Apollo, and he gives him something, and this happened to be the disease syphilis. That's what we named. Um, in 1721, so basically two centuries after India, China, and the Middle East were immunizing uh, by variolation, uh, Mary, uh, Lady Mary Woolley Montague, uh, whose husband was ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, noted that people that were given this scarified smallpox scab had a chance of developing, he knew the term immunity, but did not get full-blown smallpox, which at that time, uh, the death rate was probably in the order of 50 to 75 percent, okay? And if you did survive it, uh, because it's basically a skin anomaly, uh, you have scars and you get disfigured. In fact, many of the women, one of the individuals that survived were basically pockmarked. So she brought that back to England in 1721 and then very famously 1798, 70 years later, an observation by a physician, Jenner, okay? Edward Jenner basically noted that uh, milkmaids handling cow and the cows had cowpox, uh, were basically did not get smallpox. And so what he did is he tried an experiment, so observation and then the experimentation, and he basically developed what we now know as vaccine against smallpox. That's the terminology. And then it wasn't until uh, <laughs> almost another century, 70 years later, when Robert Koch demonstrated uh, the infectious disease, some of them could be caused by microorganisms, in this case, anthrax. And very soon after, Louis Pasteur, another famous chemist and microbiologist, considered the father of microbiology, along with Robert Koch, uh, developed a, a bacterial vaccine for chicken cholera and anthrax. Okay, and then in, um, in 1884, the first viral vaccine was made against rabies. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the modern times too. So this was the early history, and as you can see, as time goes on, more and more recognition of infectious diseases caused by microorganisms, bacteria, or viruses, being able to make a vaccine to be able to pro prohibit the infection. Um, one of the major breakthroughs in the 50s was the development of the Salk and the Sabin polio vaccine. And we're going to focus on that because that's part of what is talked about in the, the race for vaccine uh, in Meredith Wadman's book, okay? Um, but we will also talk about rubella, and we will also talk about rais rabies and, and rotaviruses. And actually, it turns out there are a number of others that are developed in modern times as a result of what they learned uh, in working with the polio vaccine and the modifications that were made. 
Uh, I just want to point out, uh, this book is actually in the library here. Uh, this is probably the encyclopedia of uh, history of vaccinology. And this is a Frenchman, Harve Bazin, and he published this in, in 2011, but obviously he worked on it quite a bit of time and went back in the literature. It's amazing. Now, I added this as an insert uh, in that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, vaccine, the terminology comes from smallpox vaccination with cowpox, which is vaccinia. So the term vaccinia, well, in 2017, in October, an article came out in the New England Journal of Medicine where an American group was able to get one of the early tubes of uh, smallpox vaccine, uh, which was from a company, uh, Mulliford, which became or merged with Smith Klein, uh, 1902. And they actually did a sequencing DNA analysis. And it turned out that this particular vaccine, and actually if you look at Jenner's papers, uh, it was a debate about whether horsepox or cowpox. So cowpox, which by the way in Latin, uh, cow is vacca, therefore vaccine, and it should really be based on this baby, equa or equine, as opposed to vaccine, but we're not going to change that. So it's amazing how observation and experimentation tells us things based on technology that you have at the time, and that's going to be a thread that comes through as we go along with this talk. Um, now, smallpox, infectious disease caused by two variants of uh, variola virus, it's small blood vessels of skin uh, and in the mouth, and uh, it was a major, major problem in the 19th and 20th century. So WHO, World Health Organization, the recognition that smallpox had only res one reservoir, and that was humans. So the question was if you could immunize throughout the world and therefore ablate any uh, active cases, given time, uh, would disappear, okay? And this is basically, they started in 1967 by mass immunizations throughout the world. And by 1980, they basically said that, the World Health Organization said that smallpox has been eradicated, okay? There's only one other virus infection that has been eradicated, and that actually occurs in cattle and horse, uh, and it's the rinderpest virus, uh, which is actually a very deadly virus for these animals because there's about a 90 or 100 percent mortality, and as I mentioned, there's about a 75 percent with smallpox. And one thing that I didn't really know what the mortality in the 20th century, this is the 20th century, just a previous one, about three to four hundred million people died of smallpox up until 1980 in the world. And that to me is an unbelievable number. Okay, now, uh, I'd like to say that we've eliminated the disease. We do know that there are two sources of uh, the smallpox virus. One is kept at CDC in Atlanta, and the other one is kept somewhere in Russia. Uh, the question is debated a microbiologist and virologist about whether they should destroy it. Well, uh, World Health Organization was just about ready in 1977 because the last active case occurred in the Sudan, in Africa, to call it. And then in 1978, there was an outbreak in Birmingham, England. Uh, there was a scientist who was trying to finish up some experiments because he knew that once it was declared no longer an issue, he would not be able to get money for his research. And as a result of <laughs> bad technique, uh, the virus traveled through the air handling system to the photography lab below and actually infected a young lady who actually subsequently died of uh, smallpox. And her father also died, but not of smallpox, but of uh, a heart attack when he visited her in the emergency room. Uh, her mother developed an active case, but she was able to be treated and survive. And there was one other death as a result of that Birmingham outbreak, and the uh, lead investigator of that lab wound up killing himself, okay, actually at a party in his house. So there were three deaths. Uh, it mobilized all of the available vaccine in the world to Birmingham because many people were isolated and put into various facilities that were P2, P3, 
just in case, but no other cases occurred. Now, uh, I'd like to say, well, that, that's all eliminated, WHO said in 1980, but in 2014, people digging around in the FDA in a freezer discovered active smallpox. Not only that, they shipped it then to the CDC to be destroyed, and they basically shipped it by parcel post, I believe, and of course they're getting dinged for that too. So we would hope that it's totally done. And then about three or four years ago, um, as we don't know, talk about climate change, but as the permafrost in Siberia began to melt, there were a number of cases of active anthrax that were occurring as a result of corpses that were being thawed and had active anthrax. Anthrax is a bacterial disease. It was one of the first that a vaccine was made. And I think there were a number of individuals that died of that. But then the Russian scientists went and looked at these corpses and found the presence of uh, uh, variola or smallpox virus. So that's another issue is uh, cadavers that are in permafrost that are going to survive the virus and if people get in contact. I mean, again, the only reservoir is humans. So uh, animals and it wouldn't be a problem. With anthrax, that is a problem. So is it really eradicated? We'll have to wait and see. Hopefully it is. Uh, I just want to point out another uh, book. I didn't bring this because I don't have a copy of it. This is Plotkin's Vaccine, brand new book. This is a modern treatise. There is a first chapter on the history of vaccinology, which is a little easier to read than Bizan's book, which is a tome. Uh, uh, but it actually talks about every vaccine that's presently available, how it was developed, what its present status is, and then its recommended use, uh, primarily for physicians and also for infectious disease individuals. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, Maurice Hilleman, in this book called Vaccinated. Uh, this is a table from Plotkin's uh, first chapter looking at all of the active uh, vaccines that are presently available, both bacterial and viral. And we're primarily going to talk about uh, this one, rabies. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, polio, which is somewhere uh, in the 20th century, right up in here, okay? And then we'll mention the other uh, rabies and uh, rotavirus also. Okay, so again, point out this book. Uh, basically divided into three sections. Part one is the cells. Uh, the cells we're going to talk about are, happen to be human diploid fibroblast, WI38. Uh, and then actually the use of these cells for the development of the rubella, the German measles. I'm not going to go into symptomology or case history, but this is a very major problem, uh, primarily for pregnant women in their last trimester. It's really, a, a, really an issue. And also rabies. I will spend a little bit of time talking about rabies. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the WI-38 wars, but more than likely I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, she has done a very, very elegant job in presenting this. This is the Wistar Institute at 36 and Spruce Street on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. It's the first independent research institute, uh, private, uh, in this country. It was founded in 1894 uh, by money from Isaac Wistar uh, for his great-great-grandfather's uh, museum of anatomical specimens. He was the first professor of anatomy and writer of an American anatomy textbook at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is a sh shot of it, and this is the book, uh, front of it showing the Wistar Institute. It's a fascinating building. Its walls are about eight to nine feet thick because it was set up originally as a museum to demonstrate anatomical specimens. Most of that is all gone now, and it's basically a research institute. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, in 1955, the Salk polio vaccine came out. And in 1961, uh, the Sabin live oral polio vaccine came out. Uh, and it took about a, a dozen years or so for these to come on, on board. Um, and it, uh, if you actually go back into an earlier medical history interest group from 2010, I gave a presentation on polio and mentioned a little bit about the vaccinology, but not very much. 
These were the three individuals that were very much involved in the vaccine development. Jonas Salk for the killed vaccine, and these two, Hilary Kaprowski and Albert Sabin, were actually vying to see who would get uh, the oral vaccine. And it turned out because uh, Sabin selected uh, his clinical trials in Russia, and you could get every Russian that took the vaccine back so they could measure antibody as well as production of virus and the feces. Uh, so his was approved and Kaprowski's not. Now at this time, Kaprowski was the, uh, made in 1957 the head of the Wistar Institute. And uh, there were issues that developed as a result of the polio vaccine. One is they use monkey kidney cells, actually rhesus monkey kidney cells, which was uh, a major problem because we basically almost exhausted the supply of uh, rhesus monkeys throughout the world in India and also in Africa. Um, there were monkey viruses that were discovered, uh, one of which we'll talk about, SV40. It's one of many uh, simian viruses that have been isolated from monkey cells. And also uh, this virus called Marburg, which is a filovirus, which is one of the viruses that cause viral hemorrhagic disease. We'll mention that. Another interesting thing was the cutter incident is defined here in that uh, inactivation of the Salk polio vaccine sometimes was not done well, which is a formaldehyde and sometimes another chemical used to inactivate it or to kill it. And active cases uh, developed. And actually with time, it turned out that a number of other batches of the Salk polio vaccine also contain uh, live viable virus and transmitted polio to individuals that were immunized. Um, and in the oral vaccine, this is one of the reasons we haven't totally eliminated polio just yet. Uh, in many uh, of the other world countries are using the oral vaccine and occasionally it will revert uh, or recombine. And so you can get active polio again. This has been an issue in the Caribbean and also has been an issue in Pakistan too. Um, and I put this as number six. Uh, there was a charge uh, when Kaprowski was studying his vaccine, live vaccine, he did it in the Belgian Congo. And this is where the HIV epidemic. And a book came out called The River, written by Edward Hooper, who claimed that the Kaprowski vaccine was made in chimpanzee cells, which is the host of origin of HIV. And basically, uh, that's how it was transmitted to humans. However, uh, a number of laboratories, specifically the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, which is very elegant in DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing, and they have an unbelievable database, that's where all the Defense Department does all their, their studies, uh, they showed that there was no connection. Uh, and actually, the uh, original vaccine used uh, the monkey kidney cells, not chimpanzee. Now, in 1953, Ludwig Gross, who was working at the Brooklyn VA, was working with a mouse leukemia virus, an RNA virus. And he noted that some of his mice, instead of coming down with leukemias, were coming down with solid tumors, and tumors of the savillary gland, parotid, he called it the parotid tumor virus. Uh, and in 1958, uh, two individuals, Sarah Stewart and Bernice Eddy, began to look at that virus, they isolated it and showed it was not an RNA, it was a DNA virus, it was a small DNA virus, and because it caused many different kinds of tumors uh, in mice, rats, rabbits, guinea pigs, ham hamsters, etc., they named it the polyomavirus. In fact, originally it was called the SE, uh, Stewart and Eddy polyomavirus, and it became a representative uh, mouse virus of this polyoma group of viruses. And then in 1960, Bernice Eddy, who actually uh, worked at the Division of Biological Standards at NIH, this group was the one that checked all of the vaccines to make sure they could be released. Uh, she isolated from uh, rhesus monkey cells in polio vaccine this SV40, simian virus 40 virus. And she showed that when SV40 was injected into newborn hamsters, two to three months later, they developed solid tumors. And so the real question then came out, well, 
is there an issue here of transmitting not only immunization to polio, but also a viable, because uh, the SV40 virus was not inactivated by the formaldehyde treatment, uh, and the ability of that virus is viability to cause tumors in humans, okay? Um, I should also mention in 1954, Bernice Eddy's other job earlier on was to test all the polio vaccine, and she was the individual that came up and showed that some of the early polio vaccine, SOC polio vaccine, contained viable virus, that the inactivation pre procedure did not work. So she's, we, we have to laud her for a lot of things that she did. Uh, and then in 1967, uh, again using, uh, they'd moved away from the rhesus monkey cells and began because of SV40 to use African green monkey cells. And a batch of African, sick African green monkeys were sent to Marburg, Germany, and also to a major pharmaceutical plant in uh, um, blah, 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 Yugoslavia, I believe, okay? Uh, and a number of individuals came down with a viral hemorrhagic disease. Uh, mortality was only about 20% compared with another uh, uh, viral hemorrhagic fever caused by this virus called Ebola. And I want to point out uh, this book uh, written by uh, Richard Preston, The Hot Zone, really talks about this very active. It was about 90 to 100 percent mortality with Ebola, this, this filovirus. So right around 1960, 61, 62, it, everything got thrown up in the air as opposed to how to make vaccines and are the monkey cells the best cells to be used or the best species to be used. And we have to thank these individuals right down. This is a, a picture of actually, this is the polyoma virus, which looks exactly like the SV40 virus. Uh, in 2013, a book came out, The Virus and the Vaccine, the true story of a cancer-causing monkey virus contaminated polio vaccine and millions of Americans exposed. This is a very well-written book, which really goes through all of the history of the, the polio vaccine and the isolation of SV40. Now, uh, a number of investigators began to look at the human population to see if there's any evidence that SV40 virus, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into this. This is my favorite virus, so I could spend the next five hours talking about it, uh, that there, they then began to look to see if they could find evidence of human tumors that had a footprint of the SV40 virus. And the one thing about this virus is it does leave its marker around, its DNA or its viral proteins. And it turned out uh, that in 2000 and, uh, well, 97, 1997, the NIH convened because that book stimulated, or evidence coming out, uh, stimulated a lot of worry. And this actually consensus looks at all of the publications and all the individuals that basically tied uh, SV40 to various human tumors uh, in, in patients, okay? In 2006, uh, Dr. Shah, actually at Temple University, is an eminent SV40 uh, uh, tumor virologist. He gave a very nice summary. It turns out that we have to be careful when we do DNA analysis in most of the laboratories that were recognizing uh, SV40 in various human tumors were also reference labs for SV40 work. And so there was an issue of contamination. And when they redid it under proper controls, it turned out there was no evidence. I remember once being at the American Association for Cancer meeting in Los Angeles and right next to my poster, which was on SV40, was another SV40 poster from the main blood lab uh, blood banking lab at uh, UCLA uh, hospital. And almost every batch of blood that they were collecting turned out to have SV40 virus. And of course, the one individual presenting it and I were the same mind, uh, we, we're not having, in a sense, proper controls. We're getting cross-contamination, which viruses can travel all over the place. Okay. Uh, the viral hemorrhagic fevers, uh, not a good group of diseases, okay? It turns out there are five group of viruses. 
the Marburg virus and the Ebola virus belong to the filovirus. And this is endemic in the African green monkeys. So around 1967, people began to think maybe there's got to be a, a different way of producing the polio vaccine and maybe other vaccines. And now we go back to the Wistar Institute again. And we go to this individual, Leonard Hayflick. I happen to know uh, Lenny quite well. He gave me my first job in 1960, okay? Uh, and he was a eminent cell culturist and also a uh, mycoplasma biologist trained at the University of Pennsylvania. And his job was to prepare and have available monkey kidney cells, rhesus and African green monkey, for the vaccine production and studies at the Wistar Institute on polio, okay? But he actually, and all the other cells that were being studied at the time at the Institute, uh, basically um, he had some time on his hands, so he had some questions that he wanted to ask. And he was able to get uh, cells from fetuses, from human fetuses at the University of Pennsylvania, and subsequently from uh, uh, Sweden. Uh, and he began to culture them. And one thing that he learned, uh, very on, okay, so uh, chronology of the WI-38, actually called them human diploid fibroblast. Every fetus and cells that he got, he labeled WI-1, WI-2, 3, 4, 5. And the, probably the most famous one is WI-38. So he cultivated the human fibroblast, uh, lung seemed to be the best, uh, from aborted fetuses from, fe from Philadelphia and Sweden. He found out, first of all, they seemed to have a finite lifespan, which went against the dogma. It sort of was the dogma of tissue culture people that if cells died in cell culture, once they were established, it was because you weren't using a proper media or you contaminated them with something uh, or you were missing one of the supplements, vitamins or amino acids. Uh, but he kept doing this and each time with a human diploid fibroblast, they went through 50 population doublings and then they would enter what he called senescence or phase three. And it's now known as the Hayflick limit. This is 1960, 61. Uh, the cells as they were replicating uh, retained a normal chromosomal character. They were diploid and they were euploid, 46 chromosomes. And that work was done by Paul Moorhead, someone also I know very well. He taught me my original cytogenetics. Uh, and they published, a, well, what they did is they submitted a paper in 1960 to the uh, Journal of Experimental Medicine, which was promptly rejected as a result of, well, the dogma is uh, you obviously are missing something, the phase of the moon, the stars, you don't have the proper media supplements, that's why they're dying. Uh, so it was rejected. Uh, subsequently, in 1961, it was published in Experimental Cell Research, and it's a classic paper it's probably a paper that's been quoted the most uh, uh, in the literature right now, uh, is that 1961 paper. They also did uh, some very interesting experiments. They wanted to know uh, whether, what was allowing these cells to keep 50 generations or not. So what they did is they began mixing cells, old cells with young cells, uh, and then used the sex marker, male cells versus female cells. And they showed that uh, old cells had a finite lifespan. If you were 40 population doublings, you only had 10 more, and they would die at 50. Well, uh, as a result of that uh, finite lifespan, it became a model for aging. Back in the early 60s, there were probably only a half a dozen people working on aging in human cells uh, in uh, the world. As a result of recognizing this, there was an unbelievable increase in the amount of work uh, and, and because it was an interesting model system and uh, I would hate to think how many papers were published but it's a, a lot. Now uh, the issue of uh, the human diploid fibroblast possible cells for human vaccine. After about five or six years it was clear that there were no viruses associated with human cells that could be isolated. And you had, it, had all of what we know about uh, uh, viruses and various strains to be able to make that identity. Now, one of the issues you don't have is, uh, is there sequences of uh, genes or sequences of viruses 
that are silent that could become active and may be involved in producing tumors, okay, in, when injected into individuals. That, that issue hasn't been answered, but there were no viruses. So it became an opportunity then to maybe substitute monkey cells uh, and replace them with human diploid fibroblasts. So that was first proposed by uh, uh, Leonard Hayflick and then Hilary Kaprowski at the Wistar when he lost the uh, oral vaccine, he began to grow uh, uh, poliovirus and actually they did a few studies showing that human generated uh, uh, oral polio vaccine produced very good immunity with, with no side effects. Most of that work was done in the Philadelphia, Philadelphia area. Um, and then in 1968, uh, Dr. Hayflick moved from Wistar to Stanford. And at this particular point in time, just before he left, he was able to characterize a particular cell strain, WI-38, and he made up about 500 vials of very early passage, around uh, four to fifth, fifth passage, which meant that you had basically uh, 40 plus more generations. And that gives you a monumental, I don't remember the number of billions, trillions of cells, but quite a few. And meanwhile, people were becoming very interested in, first of all, you didn't have to get a monkey, take its kidney, put it in culture, and you didn't have to worry about monkey viruses, but you had basically a strain. And so uh, people started to consider using diploid fibroblasts, which we'll show in the next slide. Now, the next section of the story uh, in Dr. Wadman's book has to do with the legal battles, and we'll get into that in a minute. Well, actually in 09, and I'll have a slide of this, the Nobel Prize was given to Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider, and Jack Sozak for actually looking at what gives a cell a finite lifespan, and it has to do with telomerase, okay? And then it was shown that the reason the human diploid fibroblast went through 50 cell generations and then pooped out was because their telomeres were short, and we'll show you that a little later. Okay. Uh, this is uh, one of my pictures of WI38 cells growing. This is a uh, log growth, and this is when they're near confluent. And this is not a very good chromosome preparation. It was the only one that I could find, showing you 46 chromosomes. Uh, and it's female. So the use of human vaccines, uh, human cells for human vaccines. Uh, and and we, we talked about the monkey kidney and the Marburg virus, the SV40. Um, and then in 1962, the World Health Organization convened a group over in Sweden, Karolinska, uh, with Sven Gard as the lead investigator to basically look and they actually decided that it was feasible, in this case it was WI-26, uh, to d use this as a, as a producing cell for the, the polio vaccine. And uh, in 1969, uh, Stanley Plotkin uh, used WI-38 cells to make the rubella German measles. I'm not going to spend time talking about German measles, but it's a major, major problem. And then uh, the Kaprowski group with Plotkin and Ted Victor uh, adapted rabies virus to human cells and produced the, probably the best rabies vaccine that we have now. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then uh, Plotkin went on uh, with uh, uh, Fred Clark and uh, Paul Offit to develop a rotavirus, which is a very major problem in third world countries, uh, diarrhea in children. And it uh, is a, a disease that is not nice. Well, now with this vaccine, they're fine. And if you want to go to the Wistar site, it talks about these uh, three vaccines and also one that's undergoing study now against cytomegalovirus. Okay. Now, the, the German measles is an interesting one because uh, uh, vaccines were made at the Merck Sharp and Dome uh, by Maurice Hilleman uh, in duck cells. And Smith, Klein, and French in Philadelphia also were using rabbit kidney. These two vaccines were actually approved for use uh, in the human population and actually uh, had reasonable good study. However, Dorothy Horseman, 
who was a Yale pediatrician, she began to look epidemiologically at the uh, presence of antibody and also virus and protection that occurred. And she also had access to the Wistar, WI38 Plotkin's uh, uh, rubella vaccine. And she came to the conclusion, and eventually Maurice Hilleman, Mr. Vaccinologist in the world, uh, said this is probably the best vaccine for protection of uh, the German measles rubella. And it was it took about, I think 1971 is when the vaccines were out there, uh, and it took maybe two or three more years before it became the number one. Now, uh, the rabies vaccine is an interesting story. The rabies uh, that Louis Pasteur in 1885 produced was to basically take a rabbit, inject the rabies virus into the cerebral cortex, and the animal would die, it would take the brain and then would dry it to basically inactivate the virus for one day, two day, three day, four day, five, up to 21 days to desiccate it. And then if you were bitten by a rabid dog, it's a very famous experiment uh, where first he did Joseph Meister, which was a young seven year old that was bitten uh, by a rabid dog, shown to be rabid, uh, and he received the first virus uh, in 1884. And then there's that story of the Tsar, Russia, sending about 40 Russians who had been bitten by a rabid wolf, and they got protection. At least 50% of the Russians survived. In the case of Meissner, one for one. Okay. Um, the only issue is that the rabies virus, because it's made in rabbit brain, desiccated, requires you to inject for at least 21 days, uh, uh, usually intradermally, uh, in the abdomen. And it means an injection. First of all, it's pain, painful. Secondly, uh, there's a chance that you're going to develop allergic encephalomyelitis because your immunological system begins to react against the brain sphingomyelin. And in, yeah, you may or may not develop rabies, but the good chances you may develop an allergic encephalomyelitis, which is also very bad. That's why you usually waited. I know in the 60s and 70s, when people were bitten by dogs, they actually waited and did the, the diagnosis on the dogs to make sure they were rabid before they started the treatment, because there was a great chance. Well, uh, what they did is, uh, uh, Tad Victor, shown right here, this is Tad Victor, this is uh, Hillary Koprowski and that's uh, Stanley Plotkin injecting the first batch of the particular vaccine that was made by a French pharmaceutical company. And this is the vaccine of choice, plus the fact it's also being used uh, in various areas in Europe and actually in areas of this country where rabies is endemic. And it is endemic in this country too, among certain species of, of animals. And uh, the idea is to use uh, this vaccine uh, in, baited, uh, uh, in, in baited meat and so forth, the animals eat it and they become immune and, and you can ablate it as opposed to trying to vaccinate them. Uh, and as I mentioned, in uh, regard to the aging, what causes human diploid fibroblast to age? This is Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider, and uh, Jack Sozak. The interesting thing is their work was done on uh, yeast and tetrahymena because they have a very short generation time. Human cells are like 24 to 36 hours. Yeast and tetrahymena are, are measured in minutes. Uh, and this is an article from the New York Times in 2009 that talk about it. And basically what's happening is uh, as the cells divide, the ends of the chromosomes, the telomeres, are shortened. And once you go through in the human diploid fibroblast 50 generations, you have no telomeres. Therefore, the cells can't go through another cell division. Now, in cancer cells, uh, it turns out they make an enzyme called telomerase. And therefore, they add, that's why uh, cancer cells have an infinite lifespan, because their telomerase enzyme is active and is making telomeres. So it put together, a, that's why they got the Nobel Prize for actually uh, see, Carol Greider was actually a graduate student of Dr. Blackburn's, uh, and uh, these two, Sozak and Greider, worked together after they left, but they were all in the same, but it took them about a decade or so to come to that conclusion. Now, uh, 
this came to all fruition with me because I got an invitation to go to the John Scott Award since I'm a native Philadelphia and I really didn't know what the John Scott Award was. Uh, I got a, a notice from Len Hayflick and also Paul Moorhead to attend. Uh, there was a druggist, John Scott, in Edinburgh uh, who was fascinated with uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin as a scientist and also his works. And he donated, I don't quite know how much money it was originally, but it's grown significantly. It used to be a plaque and maybe a $20 check. My guess is I didn't ask Dr. Hayflick or Paul Moorhead, Dr. Moorhead, how much the particular check, but it's a sizable amount now. Uh, and this started back in uh, 1834, and if you want to look it up, it can show you all the individuals that have won the award. Uh, Madame Curie, Thomas Edison, the Wright brothers, uh, Jonas Salk, these are individuals that have made inventions that have made our life as humans a lot easier and a lot better. Uh, Banning for the uh, uh, insulin, and it's, it's an unbelievable list. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, uh, invitation, and there's a description. There were three awardees at this. Uh, one was Susan Band Horowitz, whom I know is uh, 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 actually a, a cancer pharmacologist. She's responsible for uh, biological, well, uh, plant products and their ability to affect growth of cancer cells and cancer. She worked on Taxol. That's Susan right there. That's Len Hayflick, and that's Paul Moorhead. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, there is uh, the anecdotal story of uh, how Dr. Hayflick started on the human diploid fibroblast and how he put together the aging phenomenon, the Hayflick limit, the 50 plus or minus generations, and uh, what happened as uh, he went on, uh, there began to be a legal fight between him and the federal government about the use of these cells because when he left the Wistar, he took 500 vials of cells and they felt that he was uh, uh, using them, uh, uh, giving them to pharmaceutical companies and he actually was, but the cost, uh, he never used the money. Uh, they absconded with the cells, came to his lab and removed them uh, and he fa filed a, a suit which was in legal process for six years. And then in uh, 1980, under the Reagan administration and, and Burt Bayh and Dole Act basically said that universities and faculty who developed cells or vaccines or whatever could foretake some of the profit. And this was a major change and of course uh, the pharmaceutical industry and all of the, the companies that were developed out there in the 70s and 80s as a result of research were very interested in this. Uh, and the uh, Department of Justice, Justice basically settled the lawsuit. Uh, neither party was wrong. And there was a, a, a rather large settlement which went to the lawyer fees uh, from Dr. to Dr. Hayflick's lawyer. Okay. And uh, by this particular point in time, he did not have basically his research career had to stay on hold. So one of the interesting things of this, this whole this whole study was an observation that he made, stick to it that observation, being at an institute that was making vaccines and as an alternative source maybe the human diploid fibroblasts. Now in the studies that, that uh, uh, I put together for this talk and the slides, I happened to, uh, upon this one which was from uh, New England Journal of Medicine from 2011. Uh, it, it's actually uh, from 1910, Sir William Osler, and I probably don't know who Osler was. He was a professor at McGill University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, one of the founding professors of Johns Hopkins Medical School, and then he went to the University of Oxford. Uh, he is an unbelievable diagnostician. He published a textbook of medicine, and he instituted a lot of very, very major things. And I was looking at this, uh, the age-old the age -old struggle against anti-vaccinologists, okay? <laughs> in 1910, Osler pu uh, publicly expressed his frustration with the irrationality of the anti-vivisectionist by offering to take 10 vaccinated and 10 unvaccinated people with him into the next severe smallpox epidemic to care for the latter when they inevitably succumb to the disease and ultimately arrange for the funerals 
of those among them who would die. Uh, and this is the, uh, it wasn't called the New England Journal, it was, it was uh, a different name than Boston Medical Journal and Surgical Journal. Uh, and then he had this quote in there, or uh, when I went to the original, I should prefer to choose the latter, for the, uh, the latter meaning the unvaccinated, three members of parliament, he was in England, okay, and uh, three anti-vaccination doctors if they could be found, and then four anti-vaccination uh, propagandists. I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, sunrise and sunsetting. This happens to be uh, Monument Valley in Utah. Uh, it's a very lovely spot, uh, the mittens right here. Uh, so this is a continuing changing field with observation and experimentation, observation and experimentation. We have to keep this going. Uh, the Wistar, where it all started with the human diploid fibroblasts, I recommend this and this book, and also uh, about Maurice Hilleman, who probably holds the record for the number of vaccines uh, that have been generated. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the Merck vaccine production plant in Durham is named after him to recognize that. So uh, last week, uh, the uh, National Geographic uh, came out with this, and what caught my eye right off the bat was why vaccines matter. And this is actually the article, Why Vaccines Matter, by Cynthia Gorney, uh, and photographs by William Daniels. And it's really well done. I'm not going to go into that, but I just want to show you one figure, which is really impressive, and actually the, the book of the magazine is right here. It's showing the vaccine vic victor victories. This is uh, the size of the circle is the number of people infected die as a result, okay? Uh, so we can look at the various, uh, the one we talked about, polio. Uh, we see it here and it's disappeared completely. This is the US. This is not the world, this is just the US. So we've made some major issues. This is, I think, starts 1965. So this is pre in the 30s, 40s, and 20s. We've actually made, uh, uh, I love this figure primarily because it says it all in one shot. Now don't get me wrong, obviously we know that some mistakes have been made. Uh, we talked about a few of them with the bolt, with uh, uh, Marburg virus and the use of vaccine, but we learn by observation and experimentation. And um, I, I had to throw this one in at the end um, this has to do with uh, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who published a paper in Lancet uh, on 12 children receiving the, the, the measles, mumps, mumps, and rubella vaccine, which is the uh, uh, recommended vaccine in, uh, for pediatric patients at early age. Um, and he talked about issues related to GI problems, but the potential for autism. The paper had 13 authors of which 12 have retracted their name. Lancet has pulled the paper out and he's lost his uh, ability to publish, to, I'm sorry, publish, but to practice medicine in England. They removed his license, which was an order of the Medical Society and also Parliament. And it was all due to one individual, Brian Deere, an investigative reporter, uh, because the medical community and the scientific community let this go by and many people withheld uh, the vaccine for their children. In fact, there was an increase of measles and deaths in England as a result of that, okay? And we're still seeing the issue. I deleted the slide in Minnesota in the Somali population, uh, apparently caught onto this now, and they're withholding uh, immunization uh, for the MMR vaccine for their children. Uh, so we have to give a lot of credit to uh, people other than just the scientific community and making observations, and the press plays a very major. And I think he won an award, and he did a fantastic job. Um, and uh, are there any questions? Uh, these are not human diploid fibroblasts, but uh, actually happen to be mouse cells, but I think it's smiling, and it, I think it likes to be used to develop something that's very useful and for us to understand something about life and death. Thank you. We're going to...
now have it open for questions and answers. And if you have a question, let me bring you the microphone so we can get both the question and the answer on, on the video. Uh, it also, of course, is makes, makes everything a little louder. Um, if you have not already registered, please do so at the tall table over there. We have um, some exhibits that you can look at afterwards. We've got refreshments in the back. And there actually are a few chairs scattered throughout here. So does anybody have a question? That was a very nice seminar, John. Uh, how often nowadays are uh, vaccines made in human cells? I mean, like polio is not, for instance. Um, yeah, polio. Um, I mean, uh, I was thinking of influenza. So on the red there on the first paragraph, polio, measles, mumps, rabies, chicken pox, German measles, shingles, adenovirus, and hepatitis A. Those are the vaccines that are being made on human diploid fibroblasts. I neglected to mention that there was an article actually published by Nicholas Wade, who I pointed out earlier about the telomerase and telomeres, uh, that said that there was a finite number of WI38. So uh, two other cell strains were developed in England. One is IMR90 and the other is MRC5, Medical Research Council 5. And these are also being used. They have the same phenotype, genotype, and so forth of the WI38 cells, although there's still plenty of WI38. So these are the vaccines that are being given to humans that are made on human right now. And, um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have that Dubai uh, uh, Dole Act now of 1980, which allows people to, to be rewarded, universities, which in this case would have been the Wistar of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, starting in 1960 or so. Uh, uh, Len Hafer claims that probably five to ten billion dollars have been made by pharmaceutical houses based on these, based on these vaccines. I don't have uh, knowledge about that figure, but that's one that's claimed. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough that I remember getting the sugar cube with the uh, would have been the Sabin um, vaccination on, on it. It was a sugar cube, you know, with a, a drop of the vaccine on it. Um, I remember, I couldn't have been too old, but I remember my whole family went to our elementary school on a designated t day and time and got it. And, it. and my mother told me that when I was very young, she was very scared every summer because that's when young children were getting polio. I don't remember that, probably happily. <laughs> so this is, um, this is something that can happen in the lifetimes of your colleagues. I remember uh, when I was in elementary school, Penny Packer in Philadelphia, 1955, 1954, we were all ushered out of class into the play area outside, the cement area, and we all received the Salk polio vaccine, the killed. Uh, this was one of the first trials in Philadelphia with the Salk polio vaccine. And I, I hate to think how many times I've been immunized. And I know I have a very high titer at SV40, antibody titer. Anybody else? Well, if not, thank you well, again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.